So every summer, late summer, you get August into, into September, and you'll hear uh, some forecasts for, for bad weather. You, you'll hear of tropical storms, you'll hear of hurricanes. Um, it, it's just sort of part of our, our consciousness now. And, and you know, we have uh, IntelliCast, we have Weather Underground, we have all sorts of ways to follow, to follow the tracks of any storm that gets started. And so we, it's just so very, very much in our consciousness now. And it's hard to believe that there was a time when people were not aware of hurricanes as a threat. So in 1938, there was not a single person alive who had ever experienced a hurricane in New England. There was just absolutely no consciousness that a hurricane could come up this far. That was what happened down south, uh, happened in the Gulf, happened in Florida, happened on the North Carolina coast. It just did not happen in New England. And so people are, were um, totally, totally unprepared when this storm came, came up, the, up the coast and, and plowed into Long Island and then, and then into um, Connecticut, Rhode Island, all the way up through here. Um, nobody, so nobody had a, any idea of, in general, that there could be one, nor did they have any idea of specifically this one, because this one had sort of gone off the, there was no radar at the time, so the, the metaphor of <laughs> gone off the ra radar doesn't work. Um, so the, the way that people understood where storms were in 1938 was um, from uh, radio reports from ships at sea. And the, uh, the Weather Service had done such a fine job uh, scaring the people in Florida and everybody down there um, about the possibility of this storm that um, there were no ships at sea to speak of. And so when this hurricane started to turn um, and, and head north, um, nobody knew where it went. So, um, so it was just a, a remarkably, um, uh, people were just, they, they didn't know what hit them and in a way that is just really, really devastating. So the um, Boston Globe, this is a, from the paper the following day. There is, um, in the earlier edition, the Boston Globe said um, that um, for the first time in history, a hurricane has hit New England. I mean, this is just amazing to me to think that that even coastal uh, New England had not been hit by a, a hurricane. So it's not just up here that we had never experienced, it was down there. So the last one of any, any size had been more than a generation ago. And so um, the, um, so this, this shows the tracks of the three, the three large storms that have hit, um, that have hit New England. Um, so 1635, the, the area was barely settled by then, um, but that was uh, a very serious, a very serious hurricane. Um, then 1815, um, so at that point, the, even up in this area, we had started to be settled. Um, and then the last one, 1938. So if you think of, of major hurricanes, those are the only three that have ever come, um, that have ever had any impact on inland New, inland New England. There have been plenty that, that skirt the coast and give you all sorts of grief if you're in Providence or you're on the Cape, um, but these are the only three that have done any damage, any wind damage. Um, inland, and so that's the thing that I want to emphasize. We've had, we've had hurricanes. We experienced Irene. Irene was terrible. Irene was was essentially a flood event. Um, by the time it got up this far, um, all the wind had had dissipated. It had hit. It had made landfall nine times. It just sort of ping ponged along the coast. So so by the time it got here, it still had a lot of rain. 
but it had absolutely no wind. And so, so we had a really serious time of it in Vermont in particular, um, but, um, but it was really truly a walk in the park compared to the 38 hurricane. So um, this is um, the track of Hurricane Bill. This was in 2009. This is the, sort of the prototypical track that hurricanes take. And it, it, it's this, uh, it, it, they start off the coast of Africa, um, head west, and then, and then they go around um, an area in here, um, a, a Bermuda, the Bermuda high pressure system, which is a semi-permanent high pressure system. And so, so the hurricanes, um, some of them will come, will go straight in, um, and then they'll, they'll have an effect coastally. Um, but the ones that, that keep going, they, they, they recurve, and people just count on that to, to happen. They count on the recurve. Um, and that's because of the, 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 um, the, the weather patterns coming off of the continental U.S. Everything's blowing. All the pressures are moving from west to east, um, and so um, so once the system gets started, then um, it tends to be that it gets blown out into the into the North Atlantic. This is the track of of the Hurricane of '38. Um, so you see, so it was. It came toward Florida. They got very worried about it. Um, uh, so this is 7 a.m. on the 20th. It hit on, on the 21st. And then it started heading north. And then it just, it, instead of recurving like they expected it to, it didn't. It went, boom, straight up, the, straight up into New England. And, and this, is, this is the weather setup for, for why that happened. Um, there was... Um, the, the Bermuda High was set up much uh, farther north than normal and had been stationary all, all summer long. And so um, it was a very, very wet summer. 38 with people, it was almost like uh, without a summer. It was just so, so damp and wet. And so, um, so the, um, the jet stream, so there was a big deep trough, a low pressure system um, it, right in here, um, and then, so these steering currents all pushed it, they allowed it to go straight north, and, and this kept it from, um, from curving out. It was, this was just positioned much higher than it normally is, and so it couldn't, um, it couldn't recurve. Instead, it went straight up. So this is the only hurricane since Columbus that has ever come in to New England on this path. Um, and um, <coughs> the, um, so one of the things that, that is, um, and, and that, that compounded the damage that this hurricane did was that in the week before the hurricane hit, we had had all sorts of, a continuation of the summer long of rain but we had two, four, five inches of rain that week. So before the hurricane ever hit, the, the region was already <coughs> flooded. And so if there was no hurricane, the, um, the, it would have been known as the flood of 38 because it was really very, very serious flooding. And so, so you get all of that flooding and then boom, you bring in 100 mile an hour winds with its own system of rain as well. And, um, and it was just utterly devastating. So um, the, the story, um, there's been a, a lot of books written about it, um, and um, all of them have basically been about what happened down on the coast. Um, it's it's the, the, the um, Connecticut and Rhode Island coast, Long Island, everything got really, um, there was a tremendous storm surge 600 people died, almost all of them in the storm surge. Um, with no warning, you can just imagine that there was, it was just, people were, were just swamped, devastated. Um, it was, um, 
houses, you know, yard trees down, roads covered with trees, um, boats inland, houses out to sea. Um, this is the um, uh, 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 the Eastern States Exposition, the Big E in uh, Springfield, Mass. So th the that was the week of the of the annual big event, and so they, there was big big crowd at, at the event. They had uh, um, uh, dedicated a new Grange building that morning, and then the hurricane came, and you can see the Ferris wheels um, knocked sideways. The whole, the, this <coughs> tremendous destruction. Wind, rain, flooding, just tremendous. But it's always been um, uh, um, a coastal story. So um, the damage at the time with, to, to uh, repair, repair the damage was estimated at $300 million, which in those, um, which, which um, would be $5 billion to replace that, that, that same today. But I'll go into that later on and, and tell why um, that five billion dollar is, is um, would be would be too small for for if we had a repeat of this. Um, so um, and down on the coast, you even have a movie star involved in it. So this is Catherine Hepburn, whose um, whose house was destroyed. She lived at Old Saybrook. And um, so she, um, uh, the story is that she had been, um, she was an, an avid golfer and she had, go she had had a round of golf that morning and she had um, gotten the first hole in one that she had ever gotten. And then, um, and then she returned home and then the, the hurricane hit. So quite an eventful day for Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> so, um, but so so up until now, um, the story has really been the 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 death and destruction of what's hap of what happened down on the coast. But up here, I think that there's a very good story to tell. So there is 600,000 acres that were flattened. Um, 30,000 owners of timber, owners of, of woodlots, um, saw their bank accounts, saw their life savings just destroyed on the ground. Um, and, you know, the, the destruction that had happened down south along the coast was the same sort of thing that happened up here. The wind continued. We still had 100 mile an hour winds up this far. So all the roads were covered. Um, the um, you know trees leaning on houses, all, every road everywhere blocked. Um, just a uh, just really a, a nightmare of, <coughs> of uh, tree tree dis forest destruction. Um, so 600,000 acres in a swath of about. 15 million acres. So, so out of that, you get six, 600,000. So that's only four percent. You'd say uh, four percent was was flattened, but a much greater percentage was um, knocked down and just in in small small pieces. So um, the average blowdown was probably less than five acres. Um, it was quite patchy, but it was everywhere. And there's um, a number of reasons for the disparate destruction. And if if uh, I have time toward the end, I'll I'll try to get into that. But I I want to um, uh, do a, a little bit of reading from the book, and um, and then we'll see if we can move into that. The dawn of September 22nd ushered in two weeks of brilliant sunshine that illuminated for New Englanders their changed landscape. Street trees that had provided cool shade were tipped over, displaying their scraggly underpinnings. Familiar horizons showed startling gaps. In groves and backyards once tempered by shade, 
the light had become harsh. Leaves, twigs, branches, and limbs mixed incongruous, incongruously in piles with shingles, roofing, and doors, the natural and the man-made, all pried loose by the wind. Trees crossed every driveway, lane, back road, town road, county road, and state highway. Today's broad, open interstate highways were a distant dream, so even the heavily traveled roads were bordered by trees. The depression had slowed down the economy, but it hadn't stopped it. The Northeast was still a center of manufacturing, and trucks had to get through to deliver raw materials and finished goods to and from factories in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. People had to get to work. That meant the first priority was to clear the roads. Throughout New England, in cities, villages, and back country, people cleared the hurricane debris. In the rural areas, they piled the logs and brush separately alongside the roads, the brush to be burned and the logs to be sawn later into lumber or cut and split for firewood. As the roadside brush piles multiplied and the sun sucked the moisture out of the wood, people started worrying about a follow-up catastrophe. While nobody alive at the start of 1938 had direct memory of a New England hurricane, fire was a different story. Many people had seen or smelled the smoke from forest fires that had charred the Northeast in the early years of the 20th century. The forests on Massachusetts's Cape Cod are particularly prone to fire. Indeed, pitch pine and oak dominate the forest in this low-lying sandy region, largely because its dry soils and age-old history of periodic fire have removed the less fire-resistant species. Coastal areas have been the sites of a number of devastating fires since 900, 1900, and as recently as April 1938, a wildfire had burned 5,000 acres on the Cape and in Plymouth County and killed three firefighters. That was only five months before the hurricane hit, and surely many in the Bay State had read about it in the papers. New Hampshire, Maine, and the Adirondacks of New York hadn't had recent flare-ups, but each had experienced difficult fire seasons three decades earlier. In the summer of 1908, more than 300,000 acres burned in the Adirondacks and 142,000 burned in Maine. New Hampshire's worst year was 1903, when 504 fires burned a total of 84,000 acres. Vermont, with fewer forested acres, and a greater portion of them in the relatively fireproof northern hardwoods had its worst season in 1908 when 16,000 acres burned. These forest fires weren't on the scale of the conflagrations that routinely burn western forests each summer, but they were devastating on an eastern scale. So I go on and talk about the history of fire in, in the region, um, and then let me continue Forestry officials differed on how great and how imminent a fire threat they faced. Austin Hawes was one of the many early graduates of the Yale Forestry School who filled important forestry positions at very tender ages, taking the position as state forester in Connecticut the year after his 1903 graduation. He served two, two tours in Connecticut, sandwiched around a dozen years, in the same position in Vermont. By 1938, he'd been the man in charge for nearly 35 years, a seasoned leader full of experience with forestry and with fire. Looking back at the hurricane response in his 1957 book, History of Connecticut Forests, he reported on a meeting held in Boston two weeks after the hurricane. Also in attendance was Ward Shepard, who had been appointed director to director of Harvard Forest following the sudden death of founder Richard Fisher in 1934. Hawes didn't bother with diplomacy in his assessment of Shepard's qualification for the role. There could hardly have been a worse appointment. <laughs> Mr. Shepard knew nothing about forestry in New England and had little training in silviculture. The hurricane destroyed the magnificent pine forest of the Harvard Forest, and Director Shepard was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. 
Not realizing the difficulty of burning green timber, he conceived the idea that all of New England was in immediate danger of conflagration and rushed to Boston to get the governor of Massachusetts to take immediate action. Shepard was a Harvard Forest alum whose primary on-the-ground forestry work was in the high desert forests of New Mexico and Arizona. More recently, he had worked in Washington, D.C. as a policy analyst and a public relations officer for the Forest Service and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Those positions meant that Shepard had the ear of national officials and he wanted their immediate assistance. Hawes reports, the dramatic point in this conference was reached when John Foster, state forester of New Hampshire, stated in his calm way that he did not consider that there was any danger of immediate conflagration so long as the timber was green. Mr. Ward Shepard became so red in the face and so outraged I thought he would burst a blood vessel. He was indignant that a forester should make such a statement. Some foresters, proudly calling themselves dirt foresters, have mud on their boots and tree marking paint on their vests and trousers. Others are marked only by ink and paper cuts. <laughs> Shepard was the latter. Hawes's depiction of Shepard's agitated state is fleshed out by a story in Harvard student newspaper, The Crimson, in which the Harvard forest director fed the writer some brimstone. The fires that are likely to result from the accumulation of these huge piles of tinder will be of spectacular variety which has never been seen in this part of the country, usually being confined to the great timber stands of the west coast, he said. They will be of the type known as crown fires, where the flames shoot to a height of 500 feet, creating a mighty draft which throws burning brands half a mile ahead of the main blaze and makes it absolutely uncontrollable. The article concluded with a dire forecast for public safety. Whether this area can be saved, even with the strictest precautions, even with the strict, strictest precautions observed, seems doubtful to Shepard. And while planning for the safety of Peter Sam's 700 inhabitants, he more or less expects the town to be leveled to the ground along with an inestimable, inestimable part of the surrounding country. So um, the, this idea of the fire threat um, is really quite a controversial, um, uh, a, a controversial part of, of what happened. And um, so the um, forester, uh, the forest chief of the Forest Service was, um, was Gus Silcox. And Gus Silcox um, was uh, um, on the, he was the quartermaster on a huge, huge <coughs> fire out west that's known, that was known as the Big Burn or the, the, the Big Blow Up. So um, that was in 1910 and 84 firefighters lost their lives. It was a tremendous loss and, um, and it just seared him and so he, he really, really believed that we could, um, we could stop fire if we stopped it in its tracks. And so he's the one responsible for what's been known as the 10 o'clock policy, the 10 a.m. policy. And the 10 a.m. policy is, it means that um, any fire um, that gets started, the, um, the crews need to have it out by 10 a.m. the next morning. And, um, and so if they don't succeed in getting it out 10 a.m. the next morning, well then they're expected to get it out 10, 10 a.m. the morning after that. The, the emphasis is on suppression, immediate suppression, trying to keep fires from, from, uh, from expanding. And uh, so he, he took it on as his, his mission to do that. Um, that policy has really been discredited and, and was ultimately rescinded in the 1970s, but there's still the attitude out west that, that, that every fire is a bad fire and that every fire needs to be, uh, needs to be put out as soon as possible. Um, so Silcox was the fire chief, the, the forest chief, and then um, 
Ted Tinker was the fellow who was in charge of a new agency that was created to take care of this problem. So what happened was um, the, the Forest Service made a proposal to um, uh, do two things. One, um, clean up the, uh, um, the fire hazard so that, um, it, clean up the fire hazard and, and um, repair the ability to fight fire. And the other had to do with salvaging all of the timber that was on the ground. Um, so first, I'll just show you, this is um, what they tried to do with um, as much, any of, the, any of the timber that was down along roads, near houses, any, or um, any place that was considered at all uh, a volatile situation was, the brush was cleared to this extent, so all of the branches, twigs, right, right down to um, you know, just kind of stripping it. This is pine, you know, so they're just stripping all that, that naked. Um, so, um, so the CCC and the WPA got um, involved big time. Um, the the New Deal, the New Deal was terrifically adept at at making things happen, and so they created the Northeast uh, Timber Salvage Administration. It then used personnel from the uh, CCC and the WPA along with some uh, Forest Service personnel. The CCC, they were in camps. Um, young men, um, the camps were run by the Army. So these are, these are young, young men in, in the prime of life. The WPA was administered at the county level. It was definitely a relief program. And so every family that was on the relief rolls could send one person to work for the WPA. And so you see this, this crew here with working on the poultry truck. Um, it looks like um, they're not really getting a whole hell of a lot done. Um, and that was the reputation of the WPA. Um, the CCC was quite different, but the WPA um, were sort of known for um, uh, not getting much done. So, um, but um, this this is a listing of, of the accomplishments of of these two organizations in uh, basically the first year following the hurricane. Um, many many miles of, of trails and roads cleared. Um, they rebuilt 15 fire towers. They reestablished. Um, uh, all the trails and the telephone communication to the fire towers. That was one of the big problems was that the fire towers um, were no longer a part of the part of the uh, um, the firefighting network because they had because the telephone lines to and from them had um, had come down and so they were um, they were uh, reconnected. Um, tremendous amount of, of work. Um, what is it? Um, uh, that number is basically um, five million man days. Um, um, so tremendous amount of labor expended in in the cleanup. And then there was the salvage operation. So cleaning up the brush was one thing, but all of these logs that um, were down was another. And so the 30,000 landowners who had lost um, their, um, their, their, their bank account by, by virtue of it being blown down um, had an opportunity with the, the Northeast Timber Salvage Administration, which set up a program where they would buy delivered logs. So if you could get someone to cut and deliver the logs, they would buy them. And so, um, so there was a tremendous effort to do that. Um, the problem was that there was um, five times the amount um, on the ground blown down in a four hour period than the normal cut and harvest in, in, in the region. So in one afternoon, five times the annual harvest was was on the ground, um, and so it created great opportunity 
for um, people at the, at the um, still mired in the depression. Um, anybody who wanted to work could work. Um, logging crews, um, so besides the, the uh, CCC and WPA, there was all sorts of logging crews. People worked on these on portable sawmills. This is a, a mill um, that was, um, I write about it in the book, that it had been mothballed in 1927. The economy, it, the economy did not just start failing um, in the 30s. It was, in the 20s, was not kind to the rural economy. And so there was, um, uh, so, so this mill um, had uh, done its last job in 1927 and then it basically um, the forest grew up around it and they had to cut the trees down in order to um, extract this um, mill so it could go do some work. This, um, this mill was um, the start of a company called Colby Lumber which is still active down in, in, in Bosquin, New Hampshire. And, and Joe Colby ended up having seven mills um, to um, uh, cut up cut up the wood. This this mill here, another portable mill, is um, is uh, on the Harvard Forest, uh, cutting up Harvard Forest wood. Let me just go back. So the so a fellow earlier had asked about the ponds and pond storage. So they um, they uh, there was so much timber down that they. Um, they knew that they couldn't saw it all quickly enough because pine in particular and most of what was down, a great great majority of what was down was pine. But pine will um, stain or it will be eaten by insects. Um, uh, the pine sawyer beetle um, will get in it very quickly and so they knew that if they couldn't saw that out by the next summer that it was going to um, it was going to develop blue stain and might ha might be really riddled with beetle holes, and so they immediately started trying to find um, ponds where they could um, where they could store lumber. And a lot of the ponds around here, Post Pond, for instance, was was full of logs. Um, almost every I think any 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 pond around here probably had had logs in it. Um, and um, so they stayed there in, in some cases for a year or, or more. And there's been sort of a mythology that's developed over these huge logs left in, in local ponds and that if you were to go down there you would be able to get these beautiful logs that were there from the 1938 hurricane. But um, um, I did talk to one fellow who did some salvage of that nature and he said, "Yeah, there's there's some logs down there, but there wasn't anything particular, particularly big." And the Forest Service did um, uh, um, a study on it, and they found that something like two percent of the logs um, of the pine logs sank. Now that was pine. They couldn't put hardwood in ponds because it all would sink, and so so that they needed to to cut quickly. The, um, the one last little item here. So pine, like I said, was was perhaps out of 2.6 billion board feet that were down. Um, uh, uh, probably 80 percent of that was white pine, and white pine at the time was the most important timber species. Um, and uh, one of the one of the uses of it was making boxes. So box board. Um, was a tremendously uh, uh, important uh, commodity back then. So this is before plastic, before um, cardboard, and um, so everything was shipped in boxes made of wood. They would um, make it, uh, it, it would be down, down into quarter inch, three-eighths inch, half inch, very, very thin. Um, but this, this log yard, this log yard, is, is full of what's called um, round edge lumber. And so basically they just they, they, they just saw it straight straight through. So you see the edges on, on all of those boards. 
And that has to do with its use as box board because for boxes you're only using pieces this size, you know, the largest that. So, so the utilization on a pine log was just tremendous, and so they they used all of it. And um, so, and it didn't matter if it had knots; um, it was uh, it was it was useful. And so this was uh, 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 a tremendous use of. Of, uh, of pine at the time. Then the Forest Service came in and they wanted to saw everything square edge. So they didn't want to use lumber of this nature. They wanted to have it sawn to the, the more exacting standards that was used everywhere else. This box board was kind of a New England phenomenon. And so anyway, the, um, the Forest Service came in and they uh, insisted on on sawing it, on grading it, and sawing it differently, and so it was a, it was quite a, a big deal um, for the local people who didn't like this at all. Um, so um, there's quite a bit in the book about the box board and and log rules and the swindle stick, which is what they um, considered. They considered that they were all getting screwed on the amount of, of lumber. That, that they were being paid for, and that had to do with different ways of measuring. Um, so, I wanted to show you this. Um, I hope you can get a sense of what it is. This is a this is a map of the of New England, and all of these pins are where uh, either a sawmill or a, a pond or a dry site. So lumber was stored and or sawn at all of those places where you see a pin. And so the a graphic representation of that is this. So um, you can see that, um, that tremendous amount met in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, um, not as much in Vermont and Connecticut. Um, but just really, really dense. And then you got that little bit over there in Maine. But that was about all of it that blew down in Maine. But in through here, just tremendous, tremendous amount of, of wood down. And that has to do with the way the winds, the, the winds in a hurricane um, are um, the strongest on the right-hand side of the hurricane um, facing the direction that it's going. And that's because you have a combination of the cyclonic um, rotation of of the of the hurricane and the forward motion. So the um, the forward motion is going 50 miles an hour, and then the and then you get another 50 or 70 miles an hour on the cyclonic um, rotation, and so you get 120 miles an hour. Um, on the right hand side of the storm and you'll see on the left hand side very little damage there was tremendous rain but not so much um, not so much wind so most of the wind was there and that's where most of the blowdown was so um, I want to just move into one last question and that is um, so what's going to happen um, when the next one of these comes around um, these hurricanes, a hurricane of this nature, will come again. It'll come either next year or it'll come in 400 years. We have absolutely no way of knowing. It's, um, it is uh, a natural phenomenon, um, and if, the, if it gets set up again just, just right, um, we could have one, um, one this, this summer. Um, so, and it would take the same kind of storm and the same kind of path in order for us to be affected up here. And um, so, um, we know that, we know the kind of hurricane it'll be, but the, the, that won't change. But what has changed is that we have um, a tremendous um, uh, population growth. So in the area that, um, of the hurricane, there's now 17 million people um, living where there was 9 million. And there's also 750,000 more people out in the rural areas. 
I'm going to read just a, a little bit more. The property damage will be astronomical. 38 has been deemed New England's most devastating weather event as calculated by the cost to replace everything that was destroyed. In 2008, a company called Risk Management Solutions, which studies risk for large insurance companies, published a report on the expected damage from a replay of 38. It pegged 38 losses at approximately 300 million, which when adjusted for inflation would be around 5 billion in current dollars. It makes a further adjustment to the potential toll of a repeat performance, taking into consideration the increased population of the region and the increased average wealth of the populace to arrive at an estimate of potential damage ranging from 37 billion to 39 billion. The National Weather Service arrives at a similar estimate for a replay of 38, pegging potential losses at 41 billion. When the next big one comes, Long Island, Connecticut, and Rhode Island will once again absorb the full force of the storm, suffering the surge, the flood, and the wind. The population growth has brought with it an increase in houses, commercial buildings, vehicles, roads, and bridges. All of these along the coast will be vulnerable to a surge comparable to 38s, which brought 16 feet of water to downtown Providence. Despite the lessons of 38 and other lesser storms, people continue to build houses as close to the beach as they're allowed. Beachfront communities disappeared in 1938 when the tremendous surge knocked houses from their foundations and sucked them back into the ocean. Many people who survived did so by clinging to floating roofs and walls as they were swept out to sea. Given the penchant for shorefront development, there's no reason to suppose that we won't see damage like that happen again. If heavy rains precede and accompany the hurricane, river flooding will rival the storm surge in its capacity for chaos. As Irene and 38 both showed, a soaked sponge doesn't sop up any water. Once the soil is saturated, all the rain will flow over the ground rather than soak into it. Across New England, there are more than 100 flood control structures, many of them built since 1938. All of these dikes, flood walls, earthen dams, and reservoirs are designed to contain the rising water and stop it from rushing downstream. Many of these easily overlooked facets of the landscape attract attention only when they do their job and fill up with water. They have helped considerably in controlling smaller floods. But when up against a hundred year flood like Irene, they didn't control as much as people would have liked. In Irene, propane tanks and Subarus tumbled end over end down rivers that you might otherwise wade across without difficulty. Raging rivers took out roads and bridges and spectacular displays of nature's might. Even small streams high up in the watersheds gouged out new or deeper water courses count on serious flooding once again. Then, of course, there will be devastating wind. Much of the population increases have been in the urban and suburban areas along the coast, but 750,000 more people live in rural New England now than in 1940. The rural population boom hasn't resulted from a fecund nat native population. Instead, the gain has come from a migration of people leaving cities and suburbs for a less stressful country life. Accustomed to long commutes, the newly rural travel willingly for work, or increasingly they telecommute. Businesses that formerly could function only with a handy infrastructure of cities have taken root in home offices at the end of gravel roads, the beneficiaries of internet connections. The net result is that people are living in remote places that haven't been inhabited since agriculture ruled the land in the 19th century. Consequently, more, more miles of power lines and telephone lines can be snapped by fallen trees, despite the best efforts of right-of-way crews to minimize the risk. 
Today's communication network seems powerful and impressive, but it will keep everyone informed only until the power goes out. That could happen quickly and extensively. As we face our changing climate, it's hard not to be alarmed by weather events that seem freakish. Too many sub-zero nights, too many October and April snowstorms, too much rain in a sudden downburst, too many presidential declarations of disaster areas. Hyper aware of extreme weather, we both relish and fear a good storm. Still, we cannot be prepared for what the next 38 will bring. Once the storm turns northward and the singular combination of weather fronts steers the storm right at the heart of New England, we will all face a continuous explosion. We are powerless to stop it and powerless to diminish its incredible destructive force. It will rip roofs from buildings. It will topple trees onto our houses, roads, and power lines. It will turn every stream into a torrent. And as it's ripping our world apart, it will relentlessly scream and roar, searing into our consciousness a sound that none of us will ever forget. On that day, nature will make mankind feel puny. As the Taino people knew, Huracan is an angry goddess, and her, and her punishment can be severe. So, that's it. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm going to turn the lights back up, but that's okay. Sure. Okay. <coughs> Isn't it also true that we have um, a higher percentage of our land is forested than was in Especially in Vermont. So, in, in Vermont, um, at the time of the hurricane, it was probably about 55% um, uh, forested. Um, and of that 55%, um, maybe 10 or 15% was in very, very young trees that, you know, you could, that is a forest, but that wasn't vulnerable. And so maybe at the time, 40% of Vermont was vulnerable, and now 80% is. And the, the, the trees are, in general, um, more mature um, because the people who own land in, in the area are, are less likely to cut than people were back in the old days. So in general, we have an older, larger forest, and so tremendously um, uh, at risk. <clears throat> Could you say a little about the recovery of the forest from all this? Uh... Sure. Um, so, um, uh, my Steve, wife and I bought... Can the mic? I can't hear Okay, you. sure. You. My wife and I uh, bought our land in Corinth in 1988, and um, I was told that our woods had been blown down in the 38 hurricane, so that would have been 50 years before. And these, and it was a mature hardwood forest. Um, the trees weren't huge, but they were 12 inches, 14 inches, and and there was also a section that was pine, and um, and that had grown up after the hurricane. But so this 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 woods um, that uh, was um, blown down, um, just the hardwoods. Pines tended to be blown down in, in, in pretty good broad swaths because pine is less wind firm. Hardwoods tended to be more patchy. So um, our woods were, were blown down, but I'm sure that it wasn't, that it never looked like um, just a, 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 a clear cut. It, there would have been smaller trees that, that lasted through it. Um, at any rate, 50 years turned that for, turned a, a totally devastated forest into something that you wouldn't even know was had had had, had, had problems. So ecologically, um, the forest um, the forest recovered. 
they were they're different forests than they were um, in the pines. It tended to be um, the time the the pine. Um, would have given way to the natural forest that was there. The pine was there as a temporary placeholder because of land use history um, that when the agriculture was abandoned, the <coughs> fields grew up into pine. And so in 1938, New Hampshire and Massachusetts in particular had tons of pine ready to blow down. When that blew down, it just accelerated forest succession. And so any of the young, small, um, sapling trees that were in the understory suddenly got a lot of light and, 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 um, and those would have been hardwoods. And so um, those trees then became the new forest. So it was quite a transformation in the kind of forest that was there, um, as opposed to in Vermont where the hardwoods basically gave way to a, a newer um, crop of hardwoods because northern hardwoods um, those trees can grow within its own shade and so within a hardwood forest the species that are underneath will be the same as what's in the canopy and so take the canopy off those trees come up and You're mentioning that talking about the Harvard Forest and Peter Sam. I've forgotten because of the proximity. Was the Quabbin Reservoir had it been created earlier than that? And, and do you know about damage around there for the logs in the Quabbin? Right. I don't know that they used the Quab. I doubt they would have used the Quabbin for for logs. It had been built very very recently. The early thirties. In the yes, in the early thirties. And so that's the, for people who don't know, that's the drinking water supply for Boston and many other towns around Boston. Um, and um, because they had just done all of that clearing for it, um, there was some damage around it, but it wasn't really, it wasn't tremendous. Um, it was a young, a young forest there. So the trees that were most vulnerable were older, bigger, bigger trees. So you said that at the time this happened, the CCC and WPA were very effective and efficient in organizing the, the, the cleanup, the beginning of the cleanup, and I guess fulfillment of it. I don't really know what's in place at this time besides the money that it would take. Um, let's say it did happen soon, right? just hypothetically. I don't really know what's in place at this time that would even be able to be mobilized. Yeah, well that's a great question and that's another big, big difference. I think that um, the, the chances of our government deciding that they should really get in the logging business after this is really, really slim. We do have the, um, uh, uh, we do have the experience of Katrina. Um, Katrina um, uh, blew down, besides devastating New Orleans, it also blew down many, many forests. Um, and a, a comparable amount to 38. And what happened there was the large companies that had uh, a logging force in place um, were able to salvage and the smaller ownerships, the small, small, um, um, small holdings were, I mean, nothing, nothing happened. So, and, and, and what had happened down there and is the same as what's happened up here and that is that the, there's probably the same amount of wood being cut by the forest products industry as there was 20, 30 years ago, but it's being cut by fewer people. So the companies have gotten mechanized, and so they have large, large harvesters, and, and so they can do a lot of work in a hurry. Um, but you don't have the one guy with a cable skitter um, uh, able to to go out and, and do this work. And so when you have all of this stuff down at once and you have maybe 100,000 landowners needing work done, there's not 100,000 loggers around. It's just not. So it's not going to happen. So, but one of the things that um, we know, and this is related to Kevin's question, is the forest responds perfectly fine to this. We do not need to um, uh, we do not need to do what they did in the wake of 38. Um, 
we can um, let the forest processes do what they're going to do. We can reduce the 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 buildup of timber in the in really crucial in the in the place where there could be a lot of danger. But um, if you were to do a cost-benefit analysis and just look at what it's going to cost you, because it might end up costing you money to have someone come and 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 remove what's blown down. Much better to leave it there. Ecologically, it's much much better. It controls the site, and it's not. Um, um, it's you know we 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 feel like we that something is that we've been wronged and we need to right this wrong. But, you know, it's a natural thing and we don't really, really need to do that. Um, if, if everything, if it makes sense for you to do that, then by all means, you know, do it. But don't do it for the sake of the forest. The forest can do just fine. Makes care itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about Evidence we can see now in forests that the 38 hurricane came through. You mentioned that a little bit in the Valley News article. Yeah, I wish I had left. It. Um, so Pillars. pit and mounds yeah. is is the one really big thing that you you can see. And just because there's pit and mounds doesn't mean that it was the hurricane. But if you see a preponderance of them and they're all sort of in the same direction, then you can you can expect that that was from the hurricane. The other thing is trees that are bent, um, and they're bent, th and these would would have to. Be, the wind came from the southeast, so the, so trees would be bent to the northwest. So if either north or slightly to the west, um, but if there's if you see a bunch of trees that are are bent and they're bent and then they go straight up, so they they they'll go like that, and then either the trunk will curve back up or a branch will take over and, and go up from there. Um, so, but if you see a bunch of trees going in that direction, um, that was probably from the hurricane. The southeastern winds, as you probably know, we just don't get them here. You don't get big, powerful winds from the southeast. So anything that's blown to the northwest is probably from the hurricane. Similar. Can you say a little bit of how they knew there was that 1600 and something hurricane, and then the one that was in the well, early? Well, yeah, the 1600. There's there's historical oh, accounts. Uh, you know, there was nobody up here. Well, we don't we don't know what happened up here. We can only read that in the ground. Um, so we don't know what's. But I doubt 1635 did much up here because we would have been very far west of the track. So so I so. My contention is that the 1938 hurricane is the only one that people right here have ever felt. And that the 1815, uh, maybe, but would have been rain, wouldn't have been wind. So, yeah. What do you think would be the um, result uh, with invasive species like buckthorn? Yeah. That's another another great reason. So the question is, what about the invasive species um, that are um, around and in, in, in ready to um, invade any place that is a nice opening? Um, so you're going to get all of these openings, and if you if you do go ahead and clear and get and 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 take out the brush and take out the trees, chances are you're opening that up to um, if there are, um, if there are uh, examples of, of these species close by, if you give them an opportunity, they'll get in there. So another reason to let the trees that are there, even if they're horizontal, um, let them control the site. And if you, if you do that, you're most likely to have some impact on keeping the invasives from, from coming in. I think it's a good time to um, wrap it up as a big group. I'm sure Steve's got answers for all of the questions that didn't get a chance to get answered. And um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.